Hello, welcome to another Intro to Java programming video. In this video, I want to talk about drawing images. And in order to get started, I want to first talk about what an image is and how we deal with it. Okay, so an image is going to be any type of image file that you would normally use. Say, you know, you take a picture on your camera or your phone, or you load an image on a website, or you download an image from a website. They usually come in types like JPEG or PNG or GIF or uh, you know any of the types of image files. Right now I'm going to be working with one that's of type JPG. You can see that it's called sci.jpg. It's a JPEG. Okay. In Java the way we deal with image files is we store them in a variable of type image from the class image. We haven't talked much about variables yet and we'll get more into depth about what variables are at a later date but just so you know this thing right here is meant to store that image in the computer while the computer needs to work on it. Okay, So it's like a box where an image gets to go. It's where we keep track of the image. In order to work with the image, I have to load that image into the program. Now let's take a look at the project file structure again here. I have my source folder here where I have my Java file. It's my drawing images Java file. You can see it's that. And what I have to do is get this file right here to be um, introduced into that code. It has to be broken down into bits and brought into this code and then sent up to the screen. Okay, So I have to do something to get this file into the code here so that it's usable. And I do that usually by making um, a block of code like this. And oftentimes I'll call it load image or load images if I'm loading many images. And that loading of image has a couple of steps. First and foremost, we are using something called imageio.read uh, to get the image into the program and into this variable. Okay, so er variables store data. And we have to get that variable, that data, into the variable somehow. In this case, we're doing it using the image IO class and the read method. I'm not going to go into any more detail into explaining what this line of code is. Just know what this does is it retrieves that JPEG file and brings it into our class so that we can display that image on the screen. In order for this image IO thing to work, we have to create something called a file, and that file is going to be dependent on something called a path. So let's look at this step by step and see how it works. As you know, Java programs, uh, they execute their statements sequentially from top to bottom, unless there's some sort of branching or repeating statement, it's always going to be from top to bottom. So we're going to get uh, our, our method header here, public void load image, and I create this method so I can call it whatever I want. And then I've got this variable here called path, and it is of type string. At a previous video, we talked about what strings are. Strings are just collections of characters. And what I'm doing is I'm taking this string here and storing it in this variable called path. Now, the reason I'm making a string variable called path is because I need that path to help locate the image. What a path is in programming is it's like a step-by-step -step set of breadcrumbs that's going to lead the computer to a directory or file. In this case, this path is going to take us to a directory called images and look for a file called sci.jpg. This forward-leaning slash here it indicates that that is a, a new directory. Now, I've got something called a relative path. I'm going to talk about relative paths and absolute paths right now and talk about how they work. This path is relative. In other words, it's relative to the starting point for my project or what's called the root or working directory. In IntelliJ, the default root directory or working directory is your project folder. So in this case, it's week one. And this is where the relative paths start their search to find um, to follow along this path to find the file they need. In this case, the first thing in our in our path here is a directory called images. And if we look at the root directory here, what it's going to do is inside that root directory, it's going to look for a directory or a file called images. And sure enough, it finds it right here. 
Then we see the slash. This says that inside of images, we want to look for a resource called sci.jpg. So inside of images, I find a resource called sci.jpg. This is a relative uh, path. Relative paths are great because it makes this thing portable. If I take my week one project folder and I move it to another computer somewhere else, this will still work because it's always going to start, its starting point is going to be from the root directory. I want to show you an absolute path. I'm going to right click and choose copy path. And I'm going to paste it over this. Let's take a look at this absolute path. The absolute path is starting from C colon. So the leftmost is the base directory where we're searching from. I'm going to open up a file browser here so you can see how this relates. Now paths tell us where we currently are. C colon is almost always going to be your local hard drive on your computer. So C colon is where I am right now, computer C colon, local disk. So if you look at my, my path, it's just C colon slash. Right? Now if I wanted to find my file, you can see that there's a lot of directories that I have to burrow through. I have to look into users. So I'm going to go back to here, and I'm going to find users, and you can see inside of C colon, there's a directory called users. So I would open that up. Inside of users, I need to look at C Goral. So I'll go back here. Hey, I found C Goral right here. So I'll open it up. In there, there's one called desktop. So I'll look for desktop right there. In desktop, it says there's a directory called CSI grading. And see if I can find that. Ah, right here. In CSI grading, there's a directory called week one. Right there. This is the working directory now for my project folder. This is, the, this is a starting point for my project. Okay. Now, in week one, it says that there's a directory called images, which we saw before. I'll look for that. Here we go. And then inside of images, I should find a file or a resource called sci.jpg. And sure enough, it's right there. So you can see my path from the um, root directory of my computer, which is C, all the way down to my image is right here. Now, this absolute path is um, great on this computer. It tells me exactly where that image is stored, specifically on this computer. But now let's think. If I had this absolute path, and I tried opening this on another computer. Let's say I bring this file to North Hennepin, and I open it up on the computer there, and I try running it. It's going to look for a, a drive called C colon, which you'll probably find. In there, it'll probably um, find the folder called users. And then it's going to look for a C Goral. And it's going to find that C Goral doesn't exist, because that profile does not exist on those NHCC computers. So it would error out right here. This absolute path is fundamentally broken, because these directories don't exist on that computer. The benefits of using a relative path is it starts at the starting point of our working directory and it knows that we're going to find this, uh, this directory here that's going to store my image. So this makes it so this um, project is not portable. You can put it on any computer and as long as this directory structure is intact, it'll always find that file. Okay, So this is a path. It helps us find our image. You need to make sure that when you make your projects, you use these relative paths. Now, let's say I add another directory here. I go directory and call it pix. And if I put my image into that pix folder, I have to add another directory here to my path. pix slash sci. Now, sci is inside of pix inside of images. You can see my path reflects that. See how that works? These slashes denote another directory or resource. So from my root directory, there's an images directory. From my images directory, there's a pix directory. From my pix directory, there is a resource called sci.jpg. Clear? Excellent. Now, what I'm going to do with this path is this string is going to be used to generate a new file. And this new file is going to um, use that, that path to, um, to create a new file. And then that file is going to be used 
to read in my image from this path location. Okay? So it starts the string, creates a file, use that file in the parameter here of the image IO read method, and that's going to retrieve our image and store it in our variable. Now, once it's stored in our variable, we can use that image anywhere in our program. Now, this thing here, I'm not going to go into detail what the try and catch is. Essentially, this is a way of error handling. If, um, and it's required for image IO. If the image isn't found, it's going to catch that error. In other words, it's going to receive that error and do something with it. In this case, all we're going to do is print, do something called print stack trace, and that's going to give you an error message in the console. We're not going to worry about doing anything else with the try catch right now. Try catch can be used also to um, try to reload the image or try something different. Or, but right now, all we're going to do is allow it to print the stack trace and then kill out the program. So that's my load image method. And this is how we work with images. We have an image variable. We have to load the image, creating a path, using that file to read it in. I know that seems like a lot. But um, there you have it. That's the basics of loading images. Let's move on to actually drawing the image. We're going to do it in a, in a J-frame. So whenever we make a J-frame, we go extends, J-frame. And I want to talk a little bit about imports. As we've seen before, when we use J-frame, we have to actually import that because it doesn't exist inherently in our vanilla Java program. So if it's something that doesn't exist inherently, we have to import. And in this case, it comes from JavaX swing. So if we do import JavaX swing star, that'll import all things from swing, and it'll allow us to use JFrame. If we don't do this, you're going to see that JFrame is an error. Now, the first time you type JFrame, if you don't have it imported, one thing you can do is it's going to be red here. If I click on the on that J frame that's red and hold alt and hit enter it gives me a suggestion and the suggestion is to import class so I'm just going to click on import class and it'll do it for me otherwise to import you can just type import JavaX swing and all of our imports have to be up above the class header so all of our imports are up here now to use images we have to import JavaX image IO and the image IO class to work with images, we also have to import Java AWT because that's all our drawing stuff. To work with file, we need to import Java IO file. And then to do this try catch thing with the IO exception, we have to import Java IO exception, IO exception. So just so you know, you don't have to understand what these imports mean right now. As you get further on in programming, they'll make more sense. Just so you know, anytime you want to work with images, these are going to be the things that you need. These are all the imports that you need. You need to have these three that deal with the file and the I.O. You need to have this one that deals with the AWT, or the drawing, and this one that deals with all of the JFrame stuff. Clear? Great. Let's move on to making our the rest of our class. As we normally do, we have our main. public static void main string args and then we have our paint public void paint graphics g super paint g We've covered these things in previous videos. If all this stuff is new to you, then you might want to go back and watch some of those videos. All right, in the main, first thing we always do is instantiate an object of this class onto its own main. So drawing images, and we usually call it frame just by um, convention. You can call it whatever you want. And that's how it's done. Next, we have to set up the, the behaviors of our, of our JFrame. So we need to frame.setSize, new dimension, and then give it a size. So I'm going to make it just 400 by 400 for now. All right. Set default close operation as always. And 
then set visible. Set visible is always going to be the last thing in our main. And I'll explain why in just a little bit. All right, so I've got all that stuff. Now, load images has to be invoked or called, otherwise it's not going to run. Right now, this is just inert code. It's not doing anything. It's a potential for something to happen. But a method only comes into existence or only executes when you make your, your method call or method invocation. It hasn't been invoked anywhere in here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to invoke this up here in the main. frame.load image. Now when I make this method invocation, it's going to look for the method load image right here and it's going to execute everything inside of it. So that's going to load that image into memory so that it's now ready to actually do some painting. Alright, so we've got our main method set up and let's do our actual drawing of the image. g.drawImage and what we need are four arguments. The image, the origin, in other words, where the left -hand, upper left-hand corner is going to be, and something called an observer. I'm not going to explain the observer right now. Just know it's this has to go in there. What that's saying is that the J-frame is going to be the uh, essentially the origin point for that where that image is going to show up. So it's going to show up in the J-frame at 0 and 0 of the J-frame's graphics context. And we're going to use the image to draw. Let's see if everything works. I think it should. Run it. And there you have it. I've got my image drawn to my frame. Looks nice. Works. Great. And there you have it. That's how you set up a J-frame to load an image into memory and use that image to draw to the screen. I hope this is all helpful. Thanks for watching.